together with my colleague, um, Kyungju, um, on investing in China, uh, balancing growth and risk. And just to clarify, this is a session on Chinese fixed income markets. Um, China equities is something that we did previously. Um, so today uh, we have two great speakers uh, with us from two uh, wonderful fund management companies that are partners of Indawas. Um, first of all, I want to introduce Corwin uh, from BlackRock. Good evening, everyone. Very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Corwin Huang. I am the lead product strategist for Asian credit here at BlackRock. So we as a team responsible for all Asian fixed income and credit portfolios being managed at BlackRock. I was born and raised in Singapore. I've been with BlackRock for now coming to 11, 12 years at this point in time. I'm very glad to be speaking to you all and uh, hopefully we'll have a very good conversation later on. Great, great to have you, Corinne. And next up is Peter from Newburger Berman. Great to have you here, Peter. Hi, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Peter Ru. I'm the senior portfolio manager um, on the Emerging Market Desk Team, also the China Fixed Income Leaders strategy leaders based in Shanghai. So my career is, I initially I worked for 15 years for Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Then later I moved to China in 2011, joined the Morgan Stanley joint venture in the mutual business. So I, I kind of like I invested in China for more than 10 years now. And Wonderful. Now, so, and, and now at New Burger Berman. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. And Peter and I were at Morgan Stanley Investment Management together. So. Wonderful to have another MSIM alum join us uh, on one of our webinars. Okay, so we're gonna show some disclaimers from, as we always do, every company that is represented here today. So the three companies each have their disclaimers. Um, and then a couple of housekeeping uh, points. First of all, Slido, uh, as we always do, we'll utilize the Slido poll 568230, the number is actually below on the YouTube channel or the Facebook channel that is streaming live right now. Uh, so please go to Slido uh, to put on your questions and we'll answer that at the end of the webinar. Um, and we'll also, um, you're also able to vote up um, the most uh, you know, popular questions so that we can get to those questions first. Just very quickly to introduce Indawas for those that do not know us very well. Indawas is a fee-only wealth platform. Um, first of all, fee-only means that we do not get paid by anybody other than the client. Uh, many distributors of funds like banks and brokers and fund uh, platforms um, often receive a kickback commission like trailer fees uh, to compensate for their uh, fees, uh, but we do not get paid by any of the fund managers Anything that we receive, we 100% rebate back to clients um, so that you achieve a much lower net fee. Uh, if we can, we also access the institutional share class or the clean share class where there are no embedded fees into the structure of the fund, uh, which allows all of our investors to have a higher chance of success. We're famous for being the first and only digital advisor for CPF investing, uh, where we built a purpose-built tech stack to move uh, CPF investing online, uh, but we are a total wealth platform where you can manage all of your money here in Singapore. So your CPF, but also your cash savings and your SRS. Uh, we've been growing very rapidly. We are one of the fastest growing and one of the biggest uh, digital wealth platforms in Asia now. Uh, and we're backed by global and strategic venture shareholders uh, such as SoftBank and Lightspeed, the biggest private bank in the world, UBS, is only financial technology investment in Asia Pacific is in Dawas, Samsung and Singtel. And just last week, we announced new shareholders uh, who have funded our growth uh, process, uh, which is owned by NASPERS, the biggest shareholder of Tencent, EDBI, the investment arm of the Economic Development Board here in Singapore, Z Holdings, which owns the Line app um, and uh, is owned by SoftBank and Neighbor of Korea, uh, also joined our cap table. So. Uh, and we're really excited about the growth ahead of us, and we want to change uh, the way investing is done so that it improves the chance of individuals achieving their financial goals uh, in their future. Um, one of the key features of our fund smart platform and a revolutionary improvement on the digital fund platforms that exist out there, our investment office works hard to curate and select the best in class funds. So the two funds that represent the China portfolio today, China fixed income portfolio today, from Newburger Berman and from BlackRock are the two best China fixed income funds that we found 
across the whole region, across the globe. Uh, we've done our due diligence on the, on the products and have decided that these are the best products. Now, once we choose the best products, we put it onto the FunSmart platform and you get access to it at the lowest fee possible. So for more than 95% of the funds on our platform, uh, this Indawas FunSmart is the cheapest way uh, and the lowest cost way to access any unit trust in Singapore. But obviously uh, that's the FunSmart platform where you can buy a single fund or build a portfolio, but you can also general do general investing and also cash short-term cash um, uh, treasuries management as well. So for the core uh, general investing portfolio, we have the flagship portfolio across the six risk levels for CPF, cash, and SRS. Uh, we're the first Asian uh, platform to launch a institutional quality ESG sustainable portfolio as well. Um, and then obviously we recently just launched our Indawa satellite portfolio range where we've worked hard to do uh, what most institutional or sovereign wealth funds or, you know, like uh, university endowments would do, which is build a best-in-class uh, multi-manager, uh, best-in-class fund portfolio, which is optimized um, and um, is the lowest cost available, uh, often utilizing institutional and lowest cost funds. So with that, we've launched six initial uh, satellite portfolios. Um, and among them, obviously, technology, global real estate, mega trends are very popular. Uh, but China fixed income is one that we're really excited about. And today we have the two uh, fund managers who are joining us today. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Kyungju to introduce to you first the China fixed income in Dow satellite portfolio and its uh, brief characteristics. Um, if you want more details, please go to our landing page or our website or our Indawas Insights uh, pages for more details. And Kyungju will share uh, the portfolio now. Yeah, thanks, Sam. So if you go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so here's a quick overview of the China fixed income satellite portfolios that we have created for you guys. Um, take a note that as Sam has mentioned, this is just the excerpt, this is just a summary of our launch webinar or our insights article that we have published about two weeks ago. So if you'd like to see like the full version, learn more about our portfolio or our rationale behind the construction, please head over to our YouTube playlist to rewatch the launch webinar that we have uploaded. So anyways, the portfolio, as you can see, consists of the two best-in-class funds that we have chosen from the fixed Chinese fixed income space. And both of them are managed by the panelist firms we have here tonight, um, which are the BlackRock China Bond Fund, as well as the New Burger China Bond Fund. And we actually think that the two funds complement each other very, very nicely. So for example, the BlackRock Fund, it can invest in both onshore and the offshore market depending on where they think that the best opportunities are. But historically, this fund has skewed more towards the offshore space. Whereas the Newberger Berman bond fund, is more, it's more onshore focused. So you can expect a bulk of its investment in the onshore space, such as corporate credit and government bonds from the central government, the regional government, and even state-owned enterprises. And if you combine them together, you'll get a nice balance of both offshore and onshore exposure on average. And again, um, I think we say this in a lot of our webinars and our view, many of our viewers may know this by now, but we're always trying to offer the lowest cost um, investing to our clients. And again, we have arranged for a pretty good level of um, trailer fee rebates with both of our partners. And so you only pay around 82 basis points for a year for investing on this portfolio. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So now when we tried to construct this portfolio, we had a very specific goal in mind, which is to create an alternative way to gain exposure into China, especially for investors who are not very comfortable with investing in Chinese equities. So as you all know, Chinese equities, they have historic historically given us very high return but at the expense of high volatility as well. So as an alternative, you have the China fixed income portfolio. So if you look at this table, it compares the performance of the portfolio against other China market indices, such as onshore credit, onshore sovereign, offshore bin sum, and so on. And as you can see, although the risk adjusted return isn't the best compared to the broader market, if you actually see the best one-year return, 
the portfolio has actually been pretty favorable on this rolling one-year basis. And similarly, if you look at the worst one-year return, you can see that the losses are relatively protected. It's, it, the portfolio actually has the lowest loss in a one-year period compared to the broader market. So again, this fixed income portfolio would be suitable if you want to participate in China's growth story, but you don't want to expose yourself to the high level of risk and volatility that you can expect from the Chinese equity space. So that's it for our portfolio. Um, let's jump right into introducing our panelists firms for tonight. Um, I will pass my time on to Peter from Newberger Berman and then Corwin from Blackrock. Peter, please. Yes, hi. Newberger Berman is, uh, is, they have a history over 80 years uh, serving global clients all over the world. Okay, so right now we have mainly three business lines, equities, fixed income, and alternatives. By the way, the, the three business fixing is, is close to over like close to 190 billions and with equity follows about like 130 billions. Then we have very strong alternative offering private equities, private debts, those kind of alternative investments. So very, very exciting one. And the new Burma, the difference that number one, it's 100% uh, it's, uh, owned by all the employees. So it's very unique, independent. We focus more long-term growth rather than emphasize short-term like uh, business goals, et cetera. Right now we have uh, more than six, 600 investment professionals uh, uh, all over uh, many countries like the US, uh, Europeans, and China, Asia, et cetera. Very stable one. Um, the, the total rate, is, is much, much, much lower than most of our peers. And, and uh, because the, the, the New Bible have very unique coaches. So voted more than like, uh, continuous more than like voted number one best employees for, for more than like eight consecutive years. So this kind of like a coaching environment is really suitable for, for, for professional to have, uh, have, to focus on the investment and generate returns for our clients. And also a unique features we are, we are ESG leaders as a single A plus across all categories. So all the funds that New Burger Burma is managing right now is meet the uh, ESG standards. Thank you. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, I feel like New Burger Burma may not be the most famous fund manager out there among retail investors, but really there is a lot of best in class funds from New Burger Burma. And it's really one of our, our favorite partners, if you had to put it that way. Yeah. And then maybe after this, um, Corwin can start. Thanks, Gyeongju. Uh, my, uh, I represent BlackRock, which is the uh, largest uh, asset manager in the world. We currently manage 9.4 trillion US dollars in assets, um, but it's not just the assets under management that we are proud of. Um, BlackRock is also in at an advanced uh, financial technology firm. Uh, we now manage close to uh, $15 trillion in assets on our technology platform. And this integration of technology and asset management is definitely our key differentiator. So technology is not a cost center for us. It's actually a profit center. And that really drives um, significant advancement when it comes to financial technology within our firm, which benefits not only BlackRock, but also um, other competitors who use, utilizes our platform for their portfolio management purposes. This $9.4 trillion in assets is split across um, a variety of different asset classes, which you can see on the next slide. Um, our exposure um, is quite even across a variety of asset classes, across equities, fixed income, cash, multi-asset, alternatives, and also our index business. And this wide range of activity across all different asset classes gives us that scope and visibility in terms of how various asset classes react in global markets. And this integration of views across um, various teams and contribute as well to delivering alpha um, for, our, for our teams. Now, specifically for the team that I represent, which is the um, Asian Fixed Income and Credit Team, uh, we are now a team that is managing about $50 billion in assets and headquartered it actually in Singapore. So our leadership um, is all based out of Singapore. The bulk of our portfolio management team is also based out of Singapore. And we operate on a hub and spoke type of structure. So um, basically a lot of the lead, um, the investment decisions are made out of Singapore with on the, boot, on the ground uh, resources in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Sydney, and Mumbai. Uh, we are also one of the few Asian fixed income and credit platforms that cover everything across the entire spectrum from government bonds to investment grade credit to high yield credit 
to local currency markets across China and the region, and all the way into Asian private credit as well, where we originate loans for SMEs um, across the region. So anything to do with income, um, from government bonds to small companies, is done out of the same team, which gives us a lot of visibility when you think about capital flow across the uh, entire region. We have grown very significantly uh, out of our Singapore office. Just a few years ago, when I first joined the team back in 2013, we were managing a business of about 3 billion US dollars and it's now pushing 50 billion US dollars. So I'm very excited to be going through uh, some of the um, strategies that we'll talk about later today. Over to you, Kung Ju. Thanks for that, guys. Um, now I guess we can jump right into the panelist discussion. Sam will kickstart the first question. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, guys. And we're going to start with a much broader kind of question about um, the China fixed income space, which we're talking about today. Um, would love to hear from both of you on what your thoughts are on this specific geography of China fixed income. Um, and more specifically, your firm and the fund's investment strategy uh, on how you look at this space and how you are actually investing in the space. So I'm going to hand over to Peter first to maybe share with you um, your views and your outlook um, on China and fixed income. Thanks, Sam. Um, so good outlook for, for, for particularly since now is December, so more of outlook for, for 2022. Okay. So we believe that GDP growth has peaked uh, in quarter two, um, 2021, and very likely to be low trend over the next two, three quarters. So that's the, the main, main forecast, because the, number, the reason for the, for, the, for the below trend growth is that number one, China's starting to have a structure changing, um, prepare for the next 30, 30 years. And so deleveraging in the, particularly in the, in the property sectors uh, and the uh, emphasis on carbon neutral, green energy, renew energy, all of those things is towards trying to feel affordable when this year the growth is, is very strong. Like uh, overall, the first, first half of this year growth is very strong. Take this opportunity, China has a, to, to grab it as, as a way to start to, to do the structure change. So because the right now, uh, particularly the tightening on the real estate sectors, uh, the downward pressure on the growth, particularly for the next six months is very high now. So that's why the micro policy, particular money policy start to turn less restrictive, start, start to easing first, particularly they demonstrate in, in, the, in the RR cut uh, just uh, this week, beginning of this week. So, um, we expect more RR cut uh, in next year and maybe cut the rate, follow, follow the RR cut. Okay, the reason is the downward pressure is extremely high right now. The reform on the decarbonation, as everybody knows, China is committed to the, to the carbon neutral by, 2000, 2000, uh, by 2060. Okay, so all of this thing, uh, it's, it's a long-term goal, which you set the aggressive uh, uh, target. So government is really committed, everything, from financing, from, from manufacture, everything have to follow towards that goals. Okay, so the cost is that you, you may lower your, your growth uh, potentials. Okay, so money policy already start to turn accommodative to support the slowdown of the economy as a way. So if you mark the difference between 2022 and 2021, 2021 as a, as a year as a, we call structuring, restructuring. Okay, 2022, we more emphasize the main thing is about stabilize the growth, okay, because the, 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 the upper gap is potential could be negative, okay. Then zero COVID uh, policy will be maintained, but we expect probably by the starting second quarter after March National People's Congress and uh, the policy may be left because most of uh, citizens got the vaccine already. So it's, uh, it may be feel more safer to open the doors. And common prospecting is a very long-term goal. China government set up for the next 30 years, okay? So common prosperity, is, uh, which is really means a major China economy reorientation from many, many goals, not just for common prosperity. Number one, China used to emphasize high growth. They are going to emphasize on the quality growth, okay? And also China from manufacturing industrial uh, giant if moving in towards the service in dominant consumption, like the economy. So those are another thing. Then the third thing is really emphasize on the carbon neutral goal. 
okay, mainly means like new energy, renewable, reusable energy. All of those they have a much more opportunities uh, uh, to bring the growth to the to the China economy. So those are the main things. After those things, then our our uh, position right now is more maintain a neutral to part to overweight positions. The reason is that the easy monetary policy, easy uh, credit conditions to support the, the economy next year will set up the tune. So in an environment which is liquidity is plenty, in the in, when the liquidity is plenty in the market, typically set up a, a good foundation for, for, for both for bond market and also for the equity market too. Okay? So we have a preference for onshore credit over offshore. The reason is because onshore China government start to easing versus offshore credit, which is more driven by the US Fed and US is start to tightening. First, they start to taping, right? Tapering. Then next year, they may potentially have a pricing two or three times tightening in the rates. Okay, that's why fundamentally, onshore have a more favorable uh, support um, over the offshore. Okay, but for the property sector, because we still remain cautious on the weak names, particularly we are very optimistic on the double B names and the IG names because reason is China government already start to make policy changes in order to support the, the, the property sector, also to prevent hard lending scenario. Okay, so, so for the double A names, uh, very strong single B names, those things will benefit, but for the very weak double Bs, the single Bs, we still be, should be very cautious, should be watch for, 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 for the market evolution. Okay, so our position is, net, is really adding high quality investment grade, crossover property issue with very strong, um, Fundamental, fundamental factors also may benefit from the easing by the Chinese by the policy changes. And looking optimistic, looking opportunistic for for any like uh, with, with further policy easing, some weakness could be have a potential because they they, they are really right now traded as a very distressed level. Thank you. Back to you. Oh, just on. Your China bond, you have another slide, Peter. Okay, so our, our philosophy of the China bond fund is emphasizing the total return. Okay, so our benchmark is really focused on to beat the cash. Okay, it's like 300 bips over three, three, three months T bills. So we emphasize preserve principle, try to make a volatility, control the volatility at this time to, 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 to make stable returns. And if an opportunity, opportunity looks bright, then the downside, we may, we may add more risk. So, but principal protection is, is our number one concern and the focus. Great, thank you. We're gonna hand over to uh, Corwin here uh, to talk about the BlackRock China bond fund strategy. Great, thanks Sam. And very insightful as, as usual, Peter. And it's a pleasure to be hearing from you again. Um, so, but before I talk about the BlackRock China bond strategy, I, I thought it could be very helpful to take just a a small step back to think about why China is interesting uh, right now. And Sam talked about that briefly uh, in terms of the, the opportunity set that we're seeing right now in China and why this Dallas China portfolio has, has been built. The key themes in fixed income markets um, moving into next year is driven by two key factors. The first is the policy divergence between the US and China when it comes to monetary policy and its implications on interest rates. And the second is the current levels of yields and how that really um, differs between the US and China markets. And these two factors really um, drives the attractiveness of the China bond markets at present. So touching on, on the first point first, and this is something that has been well flagged in financial media, and that is the economic restart that is happening right now in the US the inflationary risk and what that means for monetary policy, um, and that is um, the policy that is set by the central bank on interest rates, is clearly uh, on a path towards higher interest rates. And for those of you who are familiar with fixed income investing, higher interest rates means lower bond prices, it means uh, losses to your portfolios. So that's on one hand, uh, what you see right now in the US market where the expectations is for higher interest rates moving into the next year. Not to rehash what Peter has already very eloquently provided, uh, is that the policy in, in China has clearly turned um, and that the reactions from uh, the Politburo clearly shows a, a recognition of downward trend in economic growth and, and the turn in policy has been, is, is, is clear with the recent cut in the reserve requirement ratio. And the reserve requirement ratio is basically 
um, a policy tool um, that frees up bank, bank capital um, from the reserves to do something productive to the capital. So it injects liquidity into the system. So here you have two dramatically different policy between the US and China. One, where interest rates are likely to move higher. And on the other hand, China, where interest rates are likely, likely to remain stable or moving towards a downward trend. And um, um, uh, for fixed income investors, uh, lower interest rates means higher bond prices, which is positive in your portfolios. And so consequently, when you think about this first point, uh, you can see why um, you know, China bond markets are looking very attractive right now. The second point is, um, is, is where yield levels are for risk assets in the global fixed income markets. So we have gone through a multi-year period of um, credit spread compression. And credit spread compression means that um, yields on corporate bonds have been moving lower over the past few years as investors continue to hunt for yield. And so for most parts of the global fixed income markets, uh, you end up in a situation right now where yield levels, even for bonds that are lower down the risk spectrum, is very, very low. On the contrary, um, the China dislocation in, in credit, um, it's, it's, it's very evident, as you will we'll talk about later on uh, in this webinar as well. And at this point in time, more than 50% of global fixed income yielding more than 2.5% is in China. So a combination of diverging policy and a scalable pool of income makes China fixed income very, very attractive. Now, the BGF um, China Bond Fund, which is the BlackRock version of our China Bond strategy, is a go anywhere uh, fixed income, a China fixed income portfolio. We seek to find the best opportunity across both the onshore and the offshore China fixed income markets. Now, what are these two markets? Um, the offshore China fixed income markets uh, is represented by US dollar denominated bonds that are issued by Chinese issuers um, in the um, US dollar market, and that is bonds traded outside of China. And the onshore market represents the renminbi, which is China's national currency, um, uh, denominated bonds that is traded in, um, in, in China. And because capital flows move very, um, are not fully transparent across both of these markets, you end up in situations where um, prices on, this, on different bonds by the same issuers across both markets could be priced very differently at any single point in time. So the ability of a manager to find the best price bond across both of these markets is room to generate alpha. At the same time, as Peter mentioned just now as well, there are different drivers across both the onshore and the off on the onshore and the offshore markets. In the onshore market, it's influenced by you know, onshore monetary conditions primarily. In the offshore market, there's some level of sensitivity to the Fed. Um, and, and therefore, being able to move across both of these markets allow a manager um, to identify alpha, alpha opportunities in different uh, market regimes. But what is of most interest to us right now um, is the onshore renminbi bond market, which is where we see uh, the biggest opportunity set at present. Um, and you can see that on the next slide. And the onshore renminbi bond market is split broadly into two markets. The first is the rates market, which effectively represents your risk-free market. And this is a market that is dominated by Chinese government bonds, or bonds very close to Chinese government risk. So here you get the bulk of the China fixed income market, but at the same time where you get the lowest yields. At the same time, on the right-hand side, you have um, the other half of the market, which is the credit market. And these are effectively uh, corporate bonds or bonds issued by state-owned enterprises um, um, in China. And so you get higher yields relative to um, the Chinese government bond space. And this is where we are focusing our attention on in the BGF China Bond Fund. Our goal is to deliver attractive income uh, with low volatility. Uh, and, and therefore, maximizing income means that we have a credit focus uh, in this portfolio. Now, rehashing one of the earlier points I've made in terms of the uh, lack of correlation or, or different you know, uh, factors influencing the onshore and offshore markets, you can see that dynamic at play on the next slide here. And um, here you can see that the difference in performance between the US dollar Chinese credit market and the onshore JMB credit market is very distinct. Um, across the past few years, where the correlation across both of these markets is effectively zero. And as a reminder, these two markets are basically two different markets um, where Chinese issuers are issuing in, um, but ultimately you are getting very similar companies in both of these markets, 
uh, and yet the performance drivers are very different. In 2020, um, on the back of um, US, uh, uh, on the back of the initial COVID sell-off, um, the US dollar market globally was selling off, and bond prices were falling, including US dollar Chinese credit. The Jeminbi uh, bond market was one of the sole exceptions uh, where we saw a rally as the PBOC was easing in advance of um, of the sell-off. And in that period of time, we saw the onshore Jeminbi bond market outperform the US dollar Chinese credit market. And thankfully for us, we had moved capital away from the dollar markets in the RMB market prior to the sell-off, which allowed, allowed us to minimize uh, the drawdown risk uh, in the portfolio uh, back in 2020. At the same time, uh, when the COVID risk um, abated, uh, we saw a recovery in US dollar bonds. And thankfully, we were able to shift capital back to the dollar markets um, um, before that happened, which allowed us to see a very quick recovery in our portfolio. Um, back in 2020. And this dynamic approach moving across both the onshore and the offshore markets are, um, is definitely a very strong differentiator for us. And finally, I, I, would, I, would, I would point out as well that I would, I, uh, the Endowas portfolio is incredibly thoughtful. When you think about this combination of 70% in BlackRock with 30% in the new Bergen Berman portfolio, what you get is approximately a 70% exposure to the onshore market with the 30% exposure to the US dollar market. And what that means is that you benefit from um, all the positive points that Peter and I just mentioned with regards to the onshore Remibi bond market, but at the same time, have that 30% exposure to benefit as well from this diversification that you see on this slide, with the very low correlation here, uh, to deliver very attractive income um, on your portfolios, um, while at the same time keeping volatility low. With that, I'll hand it over back to Kyungju and Sam. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you, Peter. That's wonderful. Uh, and provides a great overview and context of uh, both your uh, investment strategies and how you guys manage the portfolios, but also you know, some of the intricate details of the China fixed income market, which is still as yet a relatively young market. It's growing very rapidly. And as a result, it's quite complicated. Uh, one of the things that we want to highlight to our investors and the audience is the fact that you know, in equities, we often talk about passive investing as if that is the answer. Uh, but I think with recent developments in the Chinese market um, and, you know, how you guys have explained it, it clearly shows the strength of active management in the fixed income space. First of all, as Kyungju's previous indexes, the many indexes in China show, it's impossible to even have one single index represent the China fixed income market. Um, secondly, it's impossible to do passive investing in Chinese fixed income market right now, uh, the way it's structured. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, in, especially in this environment, um, you know, active investing and taking advantage of both the onshore and offshore opportunities, uh, strategically moving between those two opportunities will create alpha generating opportunities for the portfolio. So it's great to have both of you here to get the full picture uh, from um, from the two fund management houses. We're gonna move on to a topic. Now, fixed income, as most people know, always has to incorporate both the top-down and the bottom-up. So Peter talked about some of the macro and top-down issues that Kyungju will ask the, the, the panelists uh, for and delve into a bit more deeper later on. But one of the key bottom-up uh, features and one of the key areas where everybody is focused on right now is the China property market. Now, we've had major developments over just the past week. Um, we've had uh, not only the central government act with the reserve uh, rate cuts that Cohen highlighted, uh, but also the state government has started to move uh, with this, um, you know, um, the restructuring that is going on at Evergrande since last Friday. Um, so what, what we've heard is the Guangdong local state government uh, representative now have taken the majority of seats on the new risk management committee at Evergrande. So the restructuring is taking um, root and we have to see how that pans out. But we've also seen Evergrande, you know, move beyond that 30 day grace period for the US dollar bonds that they have not paid since November the 6th. Uh, and the most recent development today is obviously Kaiser. Uh, so Evergrande has about $19 billion of international bonds outstanding, the largest uh, such exposure within the China property market. Kaiser is the second largest actually uh, with $12 billion. So the two offshore bond exposures from the China property market, these two are the biggest. 
Um, and Kaiser has uh, obviously not paid the most recent 6.5% bond, um, you know, within the Asian hours at least uh, among the offshore bonds. So, you know, these are major developments that are happening right now. Um, and this is a hot topic. Uh, from your vantage point, um, the two of you, let's start with Corwin this time. You know, what are you seeing um, happening, you know, within the China property sector? Um, and then also maybe delve into some some your your views on some of these things that are happening right now. But at the same time, I, I would also like to hear some views about you know what else we should be looking at beyond the property sector because the property sector is a sector that I think good active managers have you know lowered their risk levels or have avoided uh, recently. So we'd love to hear some thoughts about that as much as you can share. So Cohen, over to you. That's um, a great introduction, Sam, and it pins um, the right backdrop for this discussion. And oftentimes when people think about China bonds, um, they often have this uh, pre -no preconceived notion that it's all about Chinese property credits. And that's certainly the case for your dedicated US dollar denominated high yield bond portfolios, uh, which uh, for, 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 for any of you who have current exposure to those dollar denominated pure China high yield or Asian high yield exposures, you tend to see a big drawdown in your NAV or the portfolio over the past few months or so. Um, but really the market is a relatively small market in terms of the overall size of the broader China fixed income and credit markets. Um, and it's certainly a um, part of a more diversified um, onshore renminbi corporate bond market, which is a key focus, not only for Peter's portfolio, but also for the BlackRock portfolio. So when we think about this solution that Andalas has, has created, which is a combination of the BlackRock portfolio and the Newberger Bourbon portfolio, what you get is an up in quality portfolio um, with predominantly exposures to investment grade credit, the duration, which is the sensitivity of the portfolio to interest rates um, at quite low levels at about two to three years. And this broader investment grade tilt uh, means that we are able to keep the exposure to property quite muted. All right, so when you think about our exposure in the BlackRock Fund right now in terms of US dollar denominated high yield, high yield bonds, and particularly in the real estate sector, it is closer to the 8% level, uh, which creates um, a good optionality for the strategy given the very attractive valuations we see now in China high yield property, while still achieving a very nice diversification to keep volatility low, at the same time keeping income at a very attractive level. So I, I do definitely... Um, uh, recommend uh, in, for investors um, to stay invested in China, but at the same time, maintain a diversified exposure, stay up in quality. Uh, and I definitely feel that the Andara solution does, 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 does present um, very well in, in this context. Now, the property market is a very important part uh, of the stability of the, of the broader economic and financial system onshore in China. Um, depending on how you link um, um, property um, towards its economic linkages across sectors, it, it accounts for about 20-25% of China's GDP. And this synchronized nationwide um, drop in prices does have a negative wealth effect um, on, on, the Chinese, uh, on, the, on the Chinese basis as well. Uh, it also has significant exposure to the financial sector uh, and also presents significant fiscal risk um, as land sales do account for a significant part of state revenues onshore in China. And um, Peter mentioned earlier on in his presentation that um, that they don't uh, that Newberger or Bremen doesn't expect um, a um, this this fallout to um, to to unwind in a very aggressive manner. And likewise, and given the very significant domestic transmission channel for property sector risk, um, we hold a very similar view as well. And we've seen some of the tighter uh, property policies as well. Um, the, um, uh, seeing a bit of a U-turn in, in the past couple of weeks or so. Um, some of the uh, property developers have been um, given um, you know, uh, approval to issue bonds um, onshore in, the, in the onshore market. At the same time, we've seen um, policy actions um, to lower um, uh, mortgage uh, rates and also uh, increase um, the availability of construction loans. Both of these are signs that um, there is uh, some turn in policy sentiment here, uh, moving towards um, you know, a focus back on economic risk and the impact of this property um, headwinds and how that has a potential further downward impact 
on GDP projections moving into next year. And so together with some of the uh, tone, change in tone coming from the Politburo of late, and also some of the actions across both the uh, central government and also municipal government, uh, it does feel that some of this um, policy uh, is, 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 is on a um, um, path um, towards uh, a more accommodative stance moving to the next year. On the back of some of these tighter um, conditions that we've seen over the past um, few months or so, uh, valuations, uh, which means the prices on bonds, have um, turned very dramatically, which you can see on the following slide. Um, these, this location that we're seeing right now in the China high property sector, on the next slide here, um, stands um, in, a, in a very um, stark contrast to the US high yield market. Um, sorry, Keong if you can move on to the next slide. And this, this location here presents an opportunity for investors. Um, this, this chart um, um, highlights the difference in spreads and spreads represents the yield premium of a bond relative to risk-free rate, um, that is the yield on a government bond. The red line shows the yield on China high yield spreads right now, um, which uh, on the back of the you know, past few months of um, policy tightening has resulted in very high yields on the China high yield property segment relative to where you can get in the um, global fixed income markets, particularly the US credit and developed market credit in general. And this is the reason why um, valuations on China fixed income portfolios are now incredibly attractive. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, you know, our portfolios here across um, the Endowa solution has a, a good diversification. So it allows you to capture um, this, um, this location that you can see here on this slide without having too much of a concentration towards one sector. Um, back to you, Sam. Great, thank you, Corey. And I'm going to hand over to Peter to go into a bit more detail about the property sectors. Okay, thanks, Sam. Why is this time so hard for the property company? Property company always have its, its, its activity cycles. Typically, China used to be three-year cycle from booming to a little bit kind of slow down, then booming again. Okay, so always, why this time is so different than, than the previous uh, cycles? Okay. The reason is that this round of regulation is unprecedented in the, industry, in the industrial history by terms of the length and severity, okay? Um, the reason is that even like uh, many property company has predict tight regulation, people anticipate tightening because people saw like China is quickly back to recovery since like COVID-19 COVID erupted. China is the first country to back to recovery, right? Uh, within this the journey of recovery, the two sectors contribute the most. One is export. China become a major export country, supply all the goods to all, to all countries. Okay. Number two is strong housing market. Okay. Housing market booming, real estate sales is, is great. Okay. So that two legs actually support to put the China economy back to, to its foot very, very quickly. So why suddenly it turned turn so cold, just a, like a, less than, than 12 months? Um, the reason is that China uh, saw like a, the real estate property is, is a, they always used to do a, a higher leverage, right? So with highly concentrated contracted sales, so fast turnover, okay? Well, I can turn the housing very quickly. I can re recycle the money back very quickly. So therefore, higher turnover rate, higher leveraging will have a much higher ROE, right? So that's always been the case for, the, for, for, for many cycles uh, before this time, okay? So many companies overly levered, okay? They underestimate the, 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 the government's uh, determination try to cool down the housing market to prevent the housing market bubble become too, even bigger, okay? That's the main scene, okay? Also, the housing price becomes so high that it become affordable, affordable issues. Okay, many, many will may generate lots of like social problems. That's why the China government changes make a, a new policy it's called three red lines as a way to control the, the leverage the property company uses. So three red line took place, place in August 20. Okay, and people ant anticipate that. So, so three red line is really not the killer, but it's a, it's the study. To, to, to put a lot of pressure on the property sector. So you can, you can see many may come running into trouble after that, like first like Guangzhou INF, then the Fortune Land, then Evergrande. Okay, Evergrande is, those companies are all anticipated because they're highly um, leveled.
Okay, so they run into trouble, which is kind of not surprising. But the really turning point is the Fantasia. Fantasia default in after, actually in the middle of uh, uh, China's national holiday, October, red, red October national holiday. This come back totally unexpected. Okay, so this really turned. So now you see most of the, the property sectors, the bonds trade at a very distressed level. That would really starting with the Fantasia. Okay. So what happening is that China government is, is determined to, to cool down the housing market, to put many policies as a, as a way to control the industry. Therefore, you can observe the median gross profit margin start to peak in, in 2018, then gradually coming down all the way as low as, as 20, around 20% 20 in, in, in first half this year. Okay? So many, many squeezes. And we anticipate this will happen again because China definitely says they are no longer rely on the, on the property sector as the way to generate the growth uh, for, the, for, the, for the next 30 years. Okay? So that's definitely the China, Chinese government make, make a clear in, in their mind. Okay? So next page, please. So, so the three red line is really not the killing, but this year it's the first year to implement so-called another two red lines policy of banks on the two on the two side. One is 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 limit to how much uh, bank loans to the property sectors. They they set up by uh, uh, specific rules. So large banks less than forty percent loans can go into the property sectors. Medium banks less than twenty seven point five percent, and the small banks. So really cutting the funding source to the property sector. That's on the, on the, on the financing side. On the demand side, they, they limit how much more you can give to the home buyers. So as a way to, to really control, to, to prevent people buying lots of houses, houses as, as a speculation, okay? Trying to make a, this a, housing is for living, not for speculation as, as, a, as, a, as a government policies, okay? So, and they are very serious this time. So that way, the, the home buyers, the, their buying purchase power is also limited. So those two, two hands squeeze on the property sector really limit how much the, the property can grow, but they, they still have overlap, over, over leveraged, right? So, so they have a lot of debt, mounting debt need to pay. Then certainly those two things is really forcing them to cool down in a very short period of time. That's great the trouble. Another trouble, so initially look at those two policies, it become a, like a refinancing, crisis for the property sectors. But then when, when times goes by, lots of companies start to, they saw their capital, their financing chain break down. They couldn't service their op, debt obligations. So market, all, all the parties that become, become like a very, very have a dark, dark outlook on, on those companies. Therefore it become a sales crisis now. So be not just the financial crisis, but become a sales crisis because because with, with, with the market conditions, people home, home lots of companies at the fall, like Evergrande and uh, Fortune Land, uh, IF, all of those things happen is the, people, the home buyers start to, to worry about that. If I buy the housings, if the company fails and they fail to deliver the house to me, then I may have, a, I, I committed capital to buy the house, but I couldn't get the, get the house any, anyway. So many people start to sitting on the sideline hesitate to buy the houses. So this one will generate huge sales pressure on the property sectors. At the meantime, China government also have a local government have a rule. You, the housing, you cannot drop housing price too much in the local market. Otherwise you, you'll create crisis. The government, local government will prohibit you to, to have a fire sale because you run into trouble. So therefore the home, the home developer really become a, like a binded by all their hand and foot up are binded, right? Limited the refinancing, mortgages limited, sales goes down. I couldn't cut the price in order to, to, to boost the sales. Everything just put the financial quite financial tightening liquidity squeeze on my on my balance sheet. So that's why more and more uh, home buyers have become uh, run into financial troubles. Another thing which is I didn't mark in this page, which is very critical, which is very critical. Lots of people didn't realize that it's just highly critical to determine a company may live or die. So I'll explain later, is that the housing, the, the, the administration overlooked the, the housing and construction industry, make a rule so that the, 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 the pre-sales capitals, the, the home developer cannot freely using the pre-sales capital for the other purpose. Example, in the, in the past, this rule is, is there, but nobody in, enforced it. 
So basically, I, I pre-sale the house, I can move the money out and start to other project, maybe I purchase a land or, or using other project or pay for the debts for the, for the other project, right? But this time is really strict because you couldn't move the money anymore. Imagine housing, right? You build a house, everything is based on a project, right? So project, put the money in, you start to building a house, but the debt is always a whole, is, is owned by the by the group by the by the at the at the headquarter level, right? So it used to be I can use the I can use the pre-sale money to to pay for to to meet my debt obligation, but this I couldn't. So imagine on the project level is still healthy, but with many excess money sitting in the project because of, and maybe I already pre-sale ninety percent of my house my inventories, but I still couldn't use the money to pay for the debt because until you can finish all the, the whole project, you couldn't move the money. So this, this one is, is really the killer for the, for, the, for the property developers because they couldn't use it as, a, as a liquidity management tools anymore. So those, this is the, the, the problem. So for the future, in order to solve this problem, right, China government start to policy, start to already shift to easing. So example, loans to the public sector start to easing already. So mortgage to the home buyer start to easing. Those two already start to easing, but still, they only benefit very strong developers like double B's and IG names. Okay, those can can be, can survive very easily because there's too easing on the loans and the, on the mortgage. But for the weak names, particularly for the single B's, because number one, sales still goes down. Okay, number two is that I still couldn't freely using my like free sales money in order to meet my to 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 meet the liquidity requirement. Right, therefore. But they may still default, okay? So in order to for, the, for, for China uh, to avoid hard lending on the property sectors, those two have to have change quicker. Either the housing administration relax the rules to make it a li little bit flexible so that the pre-sale capital can be easily, can be moved in certain degrees then to, 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 to easing the liquidity crunch on the property sector. Or government needs to come up with more Policy example: cut the mortgage rate, encourage people to buy the houses, make the housing price become more stable. People have a better like uh, expectations on the housing price. Therefore, then people have a have a have a willingness to start to buy the houses to generate the sales. If the sales couldn't turn, turn the corner, still hard lending scenario still there's a there's a possibility. So that's why in in the, in our oral we're still cautious on the weak names because we're waiting. The weakness is still dangerous if the, the, the pre sales uh, money uh, surveillance didn't relax or if the pre sales didn't uh, become warm. Otherwise, th there will be still a problem for the weak names. Okay? So, if you look at the, the, the rising headwind to the tighter money policy, actually, we say it's a policy easing. It's, it's, it's really not easy. It's more like a policy uh, adjustment, like to, to, to recruit. To, Correct the, the, the overlay tight policy. Let's put that way because basically the China haven't changed the rules. They they want to prevent the housing bubble. They want still housing for the living, not for speculation. Still the, the basic rule. So we cannot say housing is going to be easy. We can only say they, they are start to correct on the overlay overlay tighten tighten policies. That's so far. So this one is really put dangerous. The housing slowdown is really put dangerous on the GDP. That's why we forecast. GDP have a major slowdown in the next two, three quarters follow, following this and may potentially make the upper gap become negative for the first half 2022, okay? So why the, the Evergrande announced the, the, the fall? Uh, I think it's a Friday, right? Friday night. Evergrande said they, they probably announced they couldn't service the, 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 the debt. Then following the announcement quickly, Central Bank, PBOC, um, Banking regulators, CSRC was just security industry regulators. They all come out at the same time, announce the policy uh, correction, try to put the confidence uh, to the investor, to the people, to calm down the the, the impact on the Evergrande Evergrande situation. Okay, so why? And then on Monday, the the, the on the come on the on the following Monday. The central already start to announce the, the cut on the required reserve ratio, okay, by 50 bps as a, as a way to to put the boost to to to, the, to stabilize the situation. Why is that situation? Because as one slide uh, previously, um, it, it's in the in the in the in the in the right lower panel is about the the pre the, the housing sales money is a 
is about like more than 40% of a local government revenue. You probably heard the story, lots of uh, uh, states in China right now, uh, including the richest one on the East Coast, okay? They already announced they need to cut the salary for all the state employee. Okay, that means because the, the, the revenue for the state government become reduced significantly, they have they can they even have to cut the salary for all the state employees as a way to, to save this. So the physical crisis already start to happening in the in the local government already. That's why it's central to, to stabilize the housing market, to, to stabilize the growth for the for 2020 become very urgent. That's why you expect more cutting, more easing as a monetary policy, physical stimulus coming all the way as the next year more. Next slide. So next uh, slide. I move to the next slide, Peter. Yeah, this is okay. the next slide. Oh, this yeah. is the next slide. So, yeah. so this one as, as a way to say it, right? So the policy is coming. We hopefully, the, the goal is very clear. China government want to avoid the hard landing of the public sector. That's why uh, in this scenario, Lots of IG names and uh, strong double B names are, are, have a great investment value. Okay? Their, their spread over the government is so high that they offer very attractive returns. And those are safe names benefit by the property uh, easing, okay? policy easing and policy shift. And for those weak names, we still need to cautious waiting to see if, if it's a more easing um, policy will come in order to support the, the property sectors. Yeah, thank you guys for that. It's really, really comprehensive. Um, I think, I hope that answers some of the related questions that I'm seeing on Slido and YouTube try right now. So shifting our gear now to the more top-down and macro kind of view, um, speaking of stricter regulations in the property sector, I'm also thinking of another policy risk that is um, that, uh, that the Chinese market is facing right now, which is the common prosperity policies which, is, which the government is rolling out to attempt to close the gap between the um, unequal wealth in China. So maybe given this, can we maybe request your view on how the macro outlook on China can be impacted by the common prosperity policy? Um, maybe this time we can start with Peter and then Corwin. Okay. Um, the, the goal of common prosperity really is really aimed for is for sustainable growth because with, with wide and rich poor gaps, right? Housing become so housing price becomes so high, make it really affordable for, for, for lots of like uh, working classes and may create social uneasiness. All of those things can, can threaten the, the high growth uh, economic model. That's why China is committed to, to, to in order to achieve uh, sustainable growth for the next 30 years, and even for longer, right? You need to have a policy changes. So the, 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 the slogan for, for, this, for this one is called common prosperity. But the cost for the, to, 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 to achieve common prosperity is, is quite high, right? So the, the trending on the GDP could be lower by half point, like 0.5% to one, even 1% 1 for average over the next five years or even longer So that. So the cost is high, but however, the, the, the cost you pay for is for, for, for it to make the, 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 the growth much longer, more healthy. So society become more, more stable. Everything is pointing towards that. Also, because common prosperity also means the carbon neutral is, is also, also under common, common prosperity because in order for people to have a better, better life, not just like a rich, but also you have a better air, better clean water. All of this is also important to, to lots of people, to most of people. So that's why China government willing to sacrifice the growth a little bit, try to, but can make the growth prolong, prolonger, okay? Sure, yeah, sure. thanks, Peter. Maybe you can move on to Corwin about his opinion on this. Yes, absolutely. I think it's uh, very interesting to see how policy stance has shifted over the past few years. For the longest time, and the policy goal has been simply about economic growth. And you start off the year with a GDP growth target, and you move halfway through, and if there's a risk of it slipping, immediately you see everyone all at work across the entire um, political structure um, to, 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 to boost growth moving to, the, moving to the year. And what has really changed over the past 18 months um, to two years or so is this shift away from a policy objective 
of economic growth into a multi-pronged um, policy objective um, across both economic growth, um, environmental outcomes, common prosperity, and all of it came all at the same time where it, uh, the bureaucracy struggles to adapt to this multi-pronged approach, which is why you end up in situations where um, a particular agency becomes too um, fervent when it comes to uh, environmental uh, constraints. And uh, what the outcome of that is near-term power shortages, which obviously we, we saw in, in the past couple of months or so. But the one positive thing um, that, that obviously we can all observe here um, is how quickly um, the Chinese authorities can cost correct um, with regards to some of these uh, near-term hiccups and near-term speed bumps. And we're starting to see a bit of that uh, from a top-down um, policy standpoint. Uh, so while, we've, while Peter and I have, have uh, noted that uh, the policy is now a multi-pronged approach um, through different objectives um, over just economic objectives, um, it's very clear um, that there is now a, a near-term shift in the policy tone from both the Politburo and also from the, the People's Bank of China, which is a central bank in China, uh, with the senior leadership recognizing that this shift towards a multi um, objective, multi-policy objective um, has led to downward pressures on the economy, um, including from the property downturn, down, downturn, which we have talked about in great detail on this call. Uh, it also increases the odds of a near-term small policy um, cut uh, in policy rates. Um, that said, we don't expect big cuts in the policy rates. Um, it's more of a signal um, to banks and to reduce their lending rates. Um, but at the same time, as with um, typical um, uh, um, policy um, um, announcements. There are also warning signs in, the, in their statements to tempering expectations of investors from an overly expansionary uh, stance as well. Um, so overall, um, you know, we can see that um, clearly that the policy has, has, has shifted somewhat towards a more accommodative stance with the goal of uh, reducing financing costs on banks uh, to help boost the bank's balance sheets encourage more lending to SMEs uh, to support um, the growth and especially with uh, recent recognition around this downward pressure on the economy and also to ensure that liquidity is sufficient moving into Q1 of next year, moving into Chinese New Year and moving into um, sort of the tax payment seasons in, in January as well. Um, in the context of uh, some of the comments made earlier on this presentation, it's also very interesting to see that um, this statement of um, uh, property being um, for housing for the living and not for the speculation, which is, which was a somewhat hawkish phrasing um, that, that came out in, in July's Politburo statement, has been um, very quietly taken out in, in, in more recent statements um, that we have read, uh, which was also another sort of signal uh, that points towards um, uh, a, a focus now um, to keeping um, economic stabilization as, again, a key priority. So while the Chinese um, you know, political regime um, has certainly seen a shift in, in, in policy objectives. Um, clearly, um, economic stabilization in the near term has now um, come back as, as a top priority again. And we should expect to see this gradual shift in tone moving into the next year as well. And all of this sort of keeping liquidity robust onshore in China, uh, making sure that, um, that, they, that they avoid a, a big um, a fallout from a property um, perspective into the broader economic environment uh, should bode well um, for, for, for bond markets moving into 2022. Well, thanks guys for that. Let's, let's try to shift our attention to the brighter side of policy and regulation now. So I think Peter has mentioned this a few times already, but a lot of investors believe that areas like green financing can actually benefit from policy and regulatory changes. So can we request your views on this again? Um, maybe Peter first and then Corwin. Okay, as, as uh, Corwin mentioned, like uh, China have a very short-lived uh, uh, crisis in energy, right, in the particularly electricity, right? They cut that electricity because they sh there's shortage on the coal, fire, fire, fire uh, burning, all of those things. So China is definitely committed to, to, to the green energy uh, renew renewable. So in, um, China is committed to, to make carbon neutral by 2000, uh, 2060, okay? 
So, so there's a lot of demand for number one for the industry to change to shift like uh, from coal burning to more like solar power, wind mills, all of those like renewable energy is become more important to, to as, as it versus like a traditional carbon pool, like a coal mining kind of energy resource. So lots of funding in, in order to, 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 to cut the carbon emissions, uh, in order to upgrade your, your manufacturer facilities to, to, to make small green. Okay, so, so the demand is, is very high. But from the government standpoint, there's a lot of like a resources pour, 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 like pouring into those kind of green uh, industries. So, so the funding like green bond insurance uh, will, be, will be, have a significant growth. In, in the in the in the next thirty years, so in order to 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 support the infrastructure in the fixed asset investment, okay. So we see huge opportunities. In, uh, we will see uh, fast rising in, in green bond issuance, and also many op, op investment opportunities for for company who who commit to to make ESG, make a clean energy, and cut down the carbon emission. All of those opportunities will make great for the investment in the next thirty years. So we are very. Uh, excited to, to see these uh, opportunities in going forward. And to follow on that point, um, investing sustainably, it, it's now a core focus for a lot of investors, not just in Europe, but increasingly in Asia. And there are two key factors when it comes to investing sustainably. Um, not just in China fixed income, but also in global fixed income. And that is financial materiality and also impact. And the first financial materiality is about the impact of ESG factors and sustainable factors to the outcomes of the invest investments. And that is um, by uh, ensuring that um, you avoid um, controversial sectors and avoiding controversial um, exposures that could lead to negative outcomes from an investment standpoint. Uh, but more importantly is the impact outcomes. And that is investors are increasingly not just concerned about the financial outcomes uh, of, their, uh, of, their, of their ESG investments, but also they, are, they want to know that they're doing good. Right? And so standards and the quality of standards are increasingly important. Now, China is actually one of the largest issuers of green bonds. Uh, or recent years on the back of some of these long-term regulatory trends that Peter has, uh, has, 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 has pointed out. Um, but it, has it came with a, a myriad of different standards when it comes to defining what green is. There are right now five different green bonds in China um, uh, issued by or, or, or defined by four different regulators. And so there isn't really a standardized template of defining what green bond is in China, which is a huge problem for investors seeking to invest um, in, into sustainable investments onshore in China. And the PPOC, which is China Central Bank, recognizes that. And you see this huge push to align the product catalog. And by product catalog, we mean the definition of what it means to be green bonds onshore in China. Uh, and this alignment to global standards is progressing at a very, very rapid pace. And as this progresses, we do expect increased interest from global investors to ride the growth of ESG and green bonds in China. Uh, we do expect to see increased um, um, flows as we see greater alignment to global standards. And the second, when investing sustainably in China, is about the data. So uh, we do have a lot of data when it comes to um, an ESG uh, onshore in China. Um, and a lot of it uh, right now is in a different format or different framework when it comes to its, 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 its peers in the global fixed income markets. And we are working very, very actively with data providers onshore in, in China to use their data and to use their um, very advanced NLP technologies when it comes to identifying controversial sectors and bringing that to global investors, um, ensuring that we can compare like for like uh, ESG investments onshore in China uh, with um, our global peers um, would be a very important catalyst uh, to driving sustainable investors on sustainable investments onshore in China. And we believe that setting this standard for the industry would be an incredible or would be a very important. Um, goal for our platform and for our firm uh, moving into the next few years. Uh, and so ESG investing and defining ESG standards um, across the globe, including that of China, is a very important objective for us. 
And then clearly with this growth of ESG bonds and sustainable investments in China, uh, that is something that uh, uh, will increasingly be of focus for investors globally. Great, Corwin. Uh, thank you, Peter, as well. It's exciting that we're all aligned here on ESG uh, and the green bond of uh, investment opportunities uh, globally, but also in China. Uh, and in Dallas, obviously, was the first to launch the ESG solution, and we'd love to add to that, um, especially in the fixed income space, which has been a bit lagging. Um, we're going to go to Q&A, and we're already over time, so we're going to just answer maybe one or two quickfire questions. Our top rated question is actually a statement, brah, why are there so many people asking about equities on a fixed income webinar? So <laughs> it's the top voted question. And so to that point, I'm going to just ignore the equities questions. I apologize to the audience. This is a fixed income webinar. So we're just going to take a couple of the fixed income uh, questions. Um, basically, first of all, I mean, everything everybody wants to know is the China high yield bond sector, especially the property sector. What is the fallout? You know, what are the other sectors that we should be concerned about? Is there a risk that the Chinese high yield bond uh, or the offshore sector has contagion effect to a broader Chinese fixed income market? Uh, can you both comment on this very briefly in the interest of time? Who wants to go first, Peter? Okay, I think the policy already start to shift and there's was major, very solid uh, policy uh, correction. So I think that the, the, the there's a light already in the, uh, shining in the tunnel. So I believe that this, 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 this spread will, will, will tighten it all, over time very quickly, particularly going to the maybe no later than second, second quarter next year. You'll see second rate tightening. Sounds good. Go in. Broadly speaking, in China right now, it's no longer cool to be rich. Right? So any of the sectors that's related to this broader team is, uh, is clearly impacted all the way from the gambling sector to the lux, uh, luxury sectors, etc. cetera. Um, so not only did we see um, some negative impact on China high yield property, but also or of late, um, changes in regulations to the Macau gaming sector has also negatively impacted um, credits in the gaming sector. Now we've been massively underway uh, gaming for a long period of time now for ESG considerations. Um, but on the property side of things, um, definitely agree with, with Peter's comments here. Light is at the end of the tunnel. We are already seeing uh, some turn in policy. Um, at the same time, it's important to be diversified in portfolio construction. So while across our portfolios, we do have exposure to China higher property at current valuations for the optionality, we still prefer to maintain an up in quality um, portfolio uh, from a portfolio construction standpoint and maintaining an IG bias um, to allow us to optimize for this balance between income and risk. Mm. There's another question uh, specifically asking, what are your exposures to the Chinese property sector, like Evergrande or Kaiser? Do you have any exposure to the sector right now, Peter or Komen? Sure. We have uh, right now in the portfolio, we have uh, like a 26% in the property sectors. And uh, we don't have uh, all of those default. We don't have uh, Kaiser. We don't have uh, Evergrande. Uh, fantastic, all of those names. We have is, 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 is more in the, in the double B and IG names, like, uh, like a Sifi, Longguang, uh, Country Garden, uh, Wanke, those kind of names, mm -hmm. less risky. Yeah. Yeah. Today, yeah. we start to graduate at a very, very small pieces in Sonic. We still don't mm -hmm. even have Sonic, okay? Which, you, okay. which is like a high beta names in a, in a single yeah. space. Sounds good. Coin, are you able to share? Yeah, we have um, more modest exposure to real estate at present. Um, so across the onshore and offshore uh, markets, uh, we have um, exposure in the mid-teens. Uh, so the benefit of um, a strategy that goes across both the onshore and offshore markets is that you really expand your opportunity set to everything that China has to offer. Um, so at this point in time, we are staying away from concentrated bets. Um, no more than 50 basis points or half a percent in any single high yield mm. property name to allow us to potentially take advantage of this pickup on, of spread compression next year without taking too much of idiosyncratic risk. When you have the average yields on the sector now trading at 25%, uh, mm. you are being paid to take the sectoral risk, but you're not really being paid to take too much idiosyncratic risk. That's why diversification uh, from an issuer standpoint is, is so key. Okay, sounds good. Um, I, I think that generally uh, what, the, what we can take away is that China is not just about property sector. That's the first thing. 
And secondly, within the property sector, not everybody is Evergrande and Chiesa, right? So, you know, there are opportunities, there's collateral damage in the sector, um, there's focus on quality uh, in the portfolios generally, it seems like, but there may be opportunities uh, to pick up certain names uh, that are collateral damage and are priced at uh, attractive valuations. Finally, I want to wrap up with a question that is on a positive note, not on the negative note. Um, what is you, you? What do you feel are the most exciting areas uh, that you want to focus on in investing, over allocating in the future within the China bond market? Again, Peter, maybe first. I think like with the policy, like again, policy is easing, so bond market will be benefit from the from the liquidity, adequate liquidity. But at the same time, mm-hmm. maybe equity have a better opportunities. So. So we can get equity exposure through the convertibles. As I mentioned, China convertible is very unique in, in, in the investment investable universe. It have a lots of downside protection better as a, as a better options, like a downside protection, downside from the equity, downside from the corporate, all of those things. So make a convertible, which is perfect for, for the absolute return kind of strategies. We will yeah, look at allocating that Great. Great, thank you, Peter. Cohen, anything to add? I would say that the outcome for the end investor here um, is about the solution that the portfolio provides. And it's less about exposure to one or two sectors. So when you think about uh, our strategy right now, it's effectively a bar battling strategy. So keeping it up in quality approach with on one hand, you have your significant exposures to investment grade credit, which benefits from this divergence in policy between the US and China, which China turning towards a more accommodative stance, so that benefits the IG credit market. At the same time, having some exposure to the dislocated higher markets, which if we do, if we, if we are right and we see um, spreads um, compressing, uh, moving to next year, um, that should also benefit the portfolios as well. And taking a step back to think about where the policy easing is likely going to be, not just in property, um, in the fiscal channels, we are also expect to see uh, easing from a fiscal standpoint, which means more um, capital being injected into infrastructural type sectors, which benefits your LGFVs, uh, which is again, a very big part of the onshore credit market. So I, I do think that moving to 2020 with some of the very tight valuations right now we're seeing in global markets, with the Fed turning towards a more hawkish stance, um, the opportunity set continues to be in the China fixed income markets. At the same time, this dislocation that we're seeing across both the onshore and offshore strategies and that's both well for portfolios that are able to go across both markets. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Cohen, and thank you, Peter. And that leads me to just thank you all. Uh, thank you, Peter uh, from Newburgh Berman, Cohen from BlackRock, and Jiu from the Investment Office at Endowas. And thank you, all of you who have joined us tonight. Um, we've again gone over time. Uh, <laughs> so much to talk about in China Fixed Income. Uh, and way over what we thought, but uh, maybe just an opportunity for everybody to say thank you and goodbye. Okay, bye everybody. (laughs) Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening, good night. Thank you everyone for the time. Thank you.